Hello, welcome to Building SaaS with Python and Django. My name is Matt Lehman. I am your streamer, and we're going to build a Django app. We're going to work on a Django app, I should say. So I use this stream to teach people about Django, to teach them what I know, because I'm someone who's been doing Django web development, Django app development for a long time. If you don't know what Django is, it's a popular um, Python web framework for building um, robust applications. Um, so SaaS products, things that you might sign up for, pay for, have customers, all of that kind of stuff. And I have one of those as a side project, and let me go ahead and introduce it briefly. Uh, the project is called College Conductor. It's an, an app for um, college admissions and helping people um, deal with that stuff. Uh, the domain is not super important. In fact, I don't even know how much time we'll be spending looking at any of the app code tonight um, because of what I want to focus on. So um, you're welcome to chat. You're welcome to follow me on YouTube or Twitch if um, that will help me out, if you find this content useful. But uh, we're going to dig right into it. I'm also, I, I should also add that I'm um, I'm on my website's above at uh, mattlayman.com. You can sign for mailing list. I have a presence on Twitter. Um, so if you have questions for me later and you want to ask me, feel free to do so. I'm, I'm happy to answer, trying to answer them. Um, let's get going. Let's get into it. So what are we working on? One of the things, so last last stream, we finished up um, an account deactivation workflow. So we went through the whole process of, you know, if, if you've gone through a trial process and you don't want your credit card charged and you don't find value in the service, whatever it is, um, we made it possible to deactivate the account uh, so that people trialing don't have to contact support to do that and can just handle it themselves. So that feature is deployed, it's out in production, everything is hunky-dory. Um, and now we're, we're, I was thinking about what, what to do next. Um, and came, keep coming, kept coming back to my deployment process. So I deploy using, um, the tool called Ansible and Ansible is, it's a good tool. It, um, does a lot of work for you. It goes out and makes an SSH connection to whatever production machines you might have. And runs the steps that matter to you to make sure that your application is configured. But there's some things that about my particular Ansible deployment process that um, I don't really care for, uh, that I don't really want to do at deploy time. Uh, and I thought more about these things and wanted to make some changes to simplify deployment and or, or really yeah, it simplifies deployment. It moves some of the complexity to other parts of the app um, or other parts of the, the development pipeline, I should say. So the goal I wanted to do is get things like uh, Node.js, which builds my CSS and JavaScript. I want to get that off of the actual server. I don't want to be in the business of building my CSS code on the production server in just in order to, to display it to users. I would like to do that ahead of time and um, essentially let some other tool, some other computer handle that so that my production servers are not dealing with that complexity, not taking on that load, doing all of that stuff. So I went through and I made a milestone. So this is, if you wanna follow along, uh, this is Conductor, this is my repository on GitHub and um, I thought through all of the things that would need to happen to get to the point where I would be happy um, doing as little as possible on the production server for um, for this system. So we can walk through this, since this is the new feature that we'll be going over for a number of streams that if you want to follow along, like this is going to be a process for me, and there's going to be a lot of learning involved. I've not used all the tools that I'm referencing here, um, but it should be fun, I think. Uh, the basic idea is to do two major things. Um, currently, when I do an Ansible deploy, there is a Git clone. So Ansible on my production server has a Git clone of my code. And whenever I make a deploy, it, it does a pull onto that server to get the latest code. And then it restarts the server. And that's fine um, since I don't have a lot of traffic, but uh, there are some things that are non-optimal about that. For example, if I wanted to quickly roll back, I guess I could 
do a, a git go to a previous git checkout but that becomes kind of hard so i would like to ideally make um the the python app that i have into a package into an artifact that um can be bundled up and then my deployment process would look like download the package uh, and install it and be done. There are, are a lot of pieces along the way that would help um, simplify this even further. For example, um, my production server right now has, um, it has a compiler on it. So if someone nefarious happened to get on that machine um, through some sort of access, they would be able to run GCC, compile some software, and do all sorts of stuff that way. Uh, I don't really want that to be possible. I want to keep the production server as minimal as I can, so I would love to remove all of those kind of build tools as well. Uh, so this is the steps that we're going through to make that happen. So the, we're going to do this in a, a few-pronged approach. Um, we're going to make the Django app into a proper Python package, into a wheel, in fact, um, which is the, the name of the package that we care about. And we're also going to take the JavaScript pipeline, JavaScript, um, the, I have uh, some Node.js stuff that is running SAS and running Webpack and some other stuff that I want that stuff to also be off the server. Um, outside of building the, the CSS files, uh, that's all that the, the Node stuff is on there for. So um, if I can remove that, I can re reduce the number of packages that are installed on my production machine and thereby reduce the surface area. Uh, the, the, that's just the term that gets used in like security context of potential exploits that can happen. Because obviously if you have more code on a server, there's more opportunity, there's more uh, a higher chance that some line in that code has some sort of security vulnerability. And as I've seen from GitHub, I have you know, the, there, there are parts in the tool chain that are, are vulnerable. And if I can just remove JavaScript entirely, then that's one less attack vector that a bad guy um, of some kind could, could use to um, make my server into, you know, part of a botnet, something like that. So here is the milestone. I went through this process thinking through those steps last night. I'm sure I've missed pieces along the way. Like I said, this is gonna be a discovery thing. Um, but these are the basic things that I came up with for what we're going to do. Um, and even before I get to, into the packaging, I would like to introduce some other tooling to improve what College Conductor already has. So the first thing I want to do tonight is uh, work with uh, a tool called PIP Tools. So if you've done Python packaging or, or made Python apps, you might be familiar with uh, requirements.txt. Requirements.txt is a conventional file that gets used that um, lists essentially what packages you that come from PyPI that you want installed on your system. And there are a couple of challenges with the requirements.txt file. The, the main challenge is like, do you want that file to represent all of your applications like logical dependencies for example um, college conductor is a django app so one of the things that logically needs to be in there is django but anything that django depends on do i really want to ex to specify that explicitly not really i just care about that i have django i don't care about its sub dependencies which is sometimes referred to as the transitive closure so there are two kind of mindsets with the requirements that you can take this view where requirements, your requirements file is purely your logical set, the top level stuff that you care about that makes your app work. There's another camp that says that the requirements TXT file is for all of your packages. Like if Django has dependencies, you would actually list those dependencies as well in this requirements TXT file. And that's a good approach for making sure that everything that you install on your server is under your control. The downside is it's a lot harder to manage because you don't necessarily know 
when the pieces below it are updating or how to do that. You, it's, it's a hard, hard thing to tackle. So there are a couple of ways to handle this. One is with a tool called pipenv, um, which uh, was started by the, Kenneth Wrights, the creator of requests. And it uses a file format called a pip file and a pip file lock. Um, I've looked at that tool. And while I have a great deal of respect for what Kenneth is doing there, it's doing a little bit more than I want to do. It's managing the virtual environment stuff for me. And that's not the route that I want to go down. I want to have control of the virtual environment myself. And I want to use a tool that enables me to have that control. So in my research of other options, and there are a few, there's one other one called Poetry um, that does management as well. But the one that I found that I think is appealing to me is this tool called pip tools. And pip tools recognizes that there is this dichotomy between having logical dependencies and having this transitive closure, fancy computer science term, but all of the dependencies, right? Uh, so they, they handle this by splitting it up. And actually here's a, here's a fairly useful diagram. So they introduce this concept of you can list your logical dependencies in a requirements.include file like that. And then you run this pip compile command. And what it's going to do is interact with Py, 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 excuse me, uh, and figure out all of the packages that are needed to satisfy your set of logical dependencies. And it's going to generate a requirements.txt file that is the full pinned version, full pin set. Um, so what I want to do for my system is right now I'm kind of using requirements.txt as this just logical set. And I know that's not great. I know it's not uh, getting every dependency locked down. And that's, that's what I'm trying to solve with a tool like this. So essentially what I want to do is, is rename my requirements.txt into a requirements.include or in uh, file and then run pip tools to uh, generate the new requirements.txt so that when I do my de de deployments, they'll actually have the full set and they get locked down to a set that I know is a working set. That's the goal. So let's do that. Let's go over to the terminal and let's clear that out. Um, so what we've got here is, is you can see my requirements dev is over there. And so that's probably where I want to start. I want to have um, requirements dev. And I want to, this is all just like the grab bag of tools that I don't really care about what versions these are because these are developer tools that help me out. Uh, when I'm doing local development or you know running my pie or uh, whatever. So here is where I want to include this extra tool. And I've got this alphabetically, so I believe the package was pip install pip tools. Okay. So that will add that. And then we'll do pip install minus r requirements dev. That's going to install pip tools into everything. Um, I use Z shell, which does some funny stuff with my environment. So pip tools is probably not actually available yet. So we will probably need to deactivate this and then do work on conductor. If you're working in a different shell, I don't think that really gets you, but I've noticed it. I don't know what it is about my environment, but it causes that to happen. So now, yeah, there it is. Now we have this tool called pip compile. Great. So the second thing I want to do, I want to uh, take the pip tool, of the, excuse me, the requirements file, and I want to change it to be an include file. And we'll look at that. Whoops, uh, do this. There we go. There's a proper move. And so we can see that I've, I've renamed it. Um, so let's, let's take a look. Um, we'll come over here and get into the proper directory. That will help. We'll start Vim and look at requirements that include. So you can see 
like I have done a decent job of listing these out and pinning my versions at logical versions. So that's that's actually good news. So I think that this format, this file format, should already satisfy what pip tools or pip compile expects. And to be honest, I've never used pip tools before, so this is a bit of an experiment for me as well. Um, so we'll see. Let's read the documentation for a second. I don't have a set of .py files, so it's not going to be reading from that. Um, I've created this requirements in file. Okay, looks like we just we have this thing where we pass it to this, and looks like the default way that this thing works is by putting the output on standard out rather than um, you know committing to some file because you might have a different file name. You might not call it requirements.txt. You might call it requirements-prod.txt or something like that. So I think what I want to do is run this command to check what it produces and then overwrite requirements.txt. Check the this guy, see what else I have in here. So this is a, just an issue that tr tracking pip tools. And let's see what we've done so far. So we've already installed it. Cool. We transformed it. That was nothing more than a move. That was pretty easy. And so I think we're at the last step already. I hope that this works the way we want it to. So let's try pip compile. And I guess I should add that, so going forward, like anytime I want to add a new dependency to my project, what I'll need to do is rerun pip compile on the requirements dot include um, to generate um, this new full set of packages. Let's see what it does. And I have no idea how long this is going to run. I don't know. I don't know a lot of things about this, but we'll, we're going to find out. It's taking its time right now anyway. I got another terminal up here. Let's close that. So I probably should have piped it straight to a file. OK, cool. What I like about this, too, is, is it tells you why, all, with all these comments here, you can see that these are the extra things that are coming but and you can tell where they're coming from which is nice like you know i had no idea that uh wally is using g event no clue that was totally new and that's the problem if you if you take the tr approach of trying to manage a uh, requirements txt file that has a full list of dependencies um what happens is and this happens with large apps. It happens at my work. It happens at previous jobs that I've been on. You start you start to forget, or, or your team starts to forget. You lose the tribal knowledge, I guess, of why you have all of these specific packages on. So these comments of, you know, this thing, this James path, uh, is used by Boto three and Boto core. That's super useful to know, so that if you're tracing back, like wondering why the heck am I installing this thing. Um, that question becomes really obvious because it is listing out everything that's pointing back to those packages. So that's I really like that aspect of this too. And it gives you right away the immediate look at anything that doesn't have a comment must be uh, something that you've decided to include as a top level package. Uh, you know, having I've explicitly said I need to use beautiful soup for. So that's cool. Um, so let's rerun this, and this time we're going to um, put it to requirements.txt. Let's see if it cached anything. Oh, good. So that was way faster this time. So if we split this and do requirements.txt, now we get the nice friendly message that this is um, auto-generated, and we have the full list of everything that was pulled in, which is just fantastic. So I think what I want to do before I move on, well, actually, let's commit this. I'm happy with what's what's here. So we're going to add this. We're going to check. Uh, we've got the new requirements in file. And the requirements.txt, oh, this is cool. The diff looks a little different. Um, although it's 
reorganize stuff. Where did Django go? Oh, it lowercased it. Um, so it took out my comments, but it, you can see all of the new additions are everything that has the via. So those are the extra packages. Which tells me that I did a decent job of including the logical stuff um, and then a terrible job of, of uh, listing out the extra stuff. So I feel happy about that. And we'll commit it. And we'll say um, use pip tools. And this fixes number 379. We generated our new requirements txt. We'll say fixes 379. And we'll push it. All right. And here, this is a good example of why I want to get Node.js off of my server. Like, I don't think there are, I mean, there's probably, it, you know, if you get a government coming after you, there, I'm sure there are ways to exploit your machine. But um, I, I know for a fact that what it lists here as vulnerabilities are coming from my package JSON file, which is, you know, what NPM or what JavaScript tooling uses to track packages. Um, pretty exclusively, like these are not coming from my Python packages. So if I can get the JavaScript stuff off there, like even though, even if I had these warnings, I would be far less worried about um, what is going on in my deployments. Um, so that's, that's really, here's, that's a clear illustration of the goal. So what I want to do next is start Vagrant where I have my staging machine, which is just a virtual machine that runs the operating system that's similar to what I have as my production machine. And we'll do a quick deployment and make sure that we didn't blow stuff up. Um, and that will be kind of a test to verify that this is hunky dory. Um, I guess I've said that twice. That makes me an old timer of some kind, I think. Um, and then we'll move on to the next bit. Next bit being um, packaging. So let's do vagrant provision. So I pushed I pushed the code up to GitHub, and like I said, my deployment process has a step where it's doing git clone. So at some point along this this set of Ansible plays, which are really commands that run, uh, they're they're called plays or tasks, um, it will pull this new code, it will pull that new requirements file, and it will, it will say something like installing Python dependencies somewhere along here. Um, it's pretty close. We're, so here it is actually, fetch from GitHub, install Python dependencies. So now that we have a requirements.txt file that it has the full set, it's going to install exactly what what we just told it to, and it should be if ever, if pip tools is doing its job, it should be everything that install. Hi Marcus, welcome. So, we're, Marcus, we're just doing a deployment to my staging server on a virtual machine for a tool that I just installed, and after this is done and and the staging server still seems to be working correctly, we're going to move on to packaging up a, a Django application and starting that process. Um, but uh, I guess the, and to illustrate everything that's going on, this was all, um, these are all the things that are running during my Ansible deployment. I'm trying to get a lot of these out of here so that deployments go way faster and there's a lot less risk on my server. So that's, that's kind of the goal of what's, what's happening right now. So we have the deploy is nearly done. There it goes. And let's bring up the site. If all is well, cool. Everything. So this is my test domain, which I just have. So it looks like a real domain, like I deployed this somewhere, but I just did a, a little fancy trick of, I put a, an entry in my Etsy host file so that my machine, anytime I use that domain of conductor.test, it's going to 10.1.2.3, which the 10.1 subnet is 
is reserved for like local networks. So it's it's akin to um, your 127.0.0 kind of subnet, if you know about that stuff. So anyway, um, everything seems to be working great. The site seems to work. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing we can check is I have Slack and I'd push that up. So we'll see if the CI build still passed. And if it did, we can move on. Cool, it did. Great. Um, okay. So we've got this pip tools thing done. We're going to go back to our milestone, look at it. So thank you, people who manage pip tools. That's really cool. You made my job super easy. I don't have to think about it. Have I ever used React? Yes, I have. Um, what do you want to know about it? I'm happy to answer a question. I don't. I don't. Can't promise to have a ton of experience. I'm mostly a Python guy, but um, I do have plenty of JavaScript experience too. I used uh, React for a consulting project for an oil drilling company that needed a lot of like graphs and stuff. It was kind of cool. Um, so it was a decent experience. Okay, let's look at um, what's next. So we already are done with one, one issue. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so and JavaScript moves like a, a million miles an hour. That's kind of what I, I, I like that about JavaScript. I think that's really cool that that community is, is innovating so rapidly. At the same time, it drives me crazy <laughs> and, um, because it's just so much change. So like I have, in the past few years alone, like professionally even, I've used uh, Backbone, React, Angular, Vue.js, like all of the, the major, Ember, all of the major ones. Um, and they kind of come and go in waves and there's a lot of debate about which is best. Um, React is a good tool. I'm not gonna knock it. Um, there are some things that I don't care for about it, but I don't need to dig into them. A lot, but uh, you can you can go pretty far away with that. I will say that um, the site that we're looking at, uh, I found that so I, this used to be an Ember app, and Ember is a cool tool. It's really cool for making very rich applications. Um, but here's the caveat: uh, you have to manage like an essentially an API server and an entire front end app. And what I found is that I ended up duplicating a lot of like the modeling that I would do on the back end side. I would have to have an equivalent model on the embers on the ember side. I don't know. The same is not necessarily true of React because it's a little bit lighter. Um, but that was my experience with Ember. Uh, so what I did actually about a year ago is I I just gutted the Ember app. I went back to um, Django, just straight up server side rendering Django templates, and my development speed went through the roof. So, you know, I've, I've got a blog post that I have planning, I'm planning to write in some point in the future talking about, um, you know, should you be using JavaScript for like a new business? And I'm, I'm pretty quickly coming to the opinion that unless you're making something very specifically that needs JavaScript, and I don't know what that would be, uh, but if you're making a standard kind of business CRUD app that you should stick to server-side template rendering. Not to say you shouldn't learn React, but um, you know everything has its place. Okay, so let's look at what is going on here. The next part of this process for getting the tools and stuff out of my deployment is uh, taking my my Django application and making it a proper Python package. Um, I've done plenty of Python packaging in the past. Uh, have some stuff that's on PyPI. So this process is not foreign to me. What is a little foreign to me is doing it for an application that is like going to be on the web. Like I'm used to making libraries, but I'm not used to making something that is a Python package. So you might ask like the, the next obvious point of, well, then why are you, why are you doing this? Uh, and it, it kind of follows along the chain. Let's actually go back to the milestone. <clears throat> so 
if you look a little bit ahead, you'll see that there's this thing called platter. I'll bring up the docs. Platter, where are you? So platter is a package that I found that what it does is it takes your entire app and it bundles it all together. Like, so if you have dependencies, bundles it in. If you have your code, bundles it in. So what you actually put on the server is uh, a tarball, an archive that you are able to like download really quickly, unzip, run a quick installer script, and in theory, you should be done. Uh, but as I was reading through the documentation, what I learned about Platter is that in order to even use it, you have to make your own code, your own app, into a package. So my end goal here is that I am I'm moving towards Platter um, because I think it has these benefits of when I do my deployment, I just want my deployment to pull something down, unzip it, run an install script, be done, and get out rather than what it does today of pulling from a git clone going out to pypi to get extra packages running installers on all of those you know i don't want any of that stuff happening on the server um, because i think it in introduces this opportunity for uh failures that shouldn't happen during deployments and i guess i should say that i am planning to do this kind of step of platter build on my continuous integration server. So the overall goal is build this, build a Python package, build a platter build, which can you know pull in your dependencies and make this one tarball. And I wanna do all of that on CircleCI where I run continuous integration. And once CircleCI is making this archive file, I wanna take that archive file and upload it to Amazon S3, cloud um, object storage, bucket storage, that if, if you're using on the cloud is, is super popular. It's a super easy way to store files. Um, so once I have a place to put deployed versions, then my deployment process, all it has to do is know about the bucket, know which version to pull, pull it down, extract it, run the installer. Hope that makes sense. That's, so that's the overall vision of what's going on. And this is not even getting into the JavaScript piece of this right now. So this is purely like trying to simplify the Python management of this process. So let's see, we are here and we actually I've got this issue open already. So what do we need to do? There are a few pieces about to this. Um, we need to add a setup.py file. That is the way, that is a way, Python packaging is complicated. That is the most common way to set up a Python package is with a setup.py file. And then once we try that out, we'll, we'll see if, how, how much we need to do to pull in everything that we needed, that we need. But I actually want to, I think probably want to get to this bullet point first. That's a, that's a new feature in GitHub. Dragging, dragging your checkboxes around. That's cool. Didn't know you could do that. So let's look at the code structure a little bit. If we look here, we'll see a few files. Um, actually, let me clear that and do ls. Okay. So you got a clearer view of this. So we don't care about the license, the make file. None of these files need to be in there. Those are all ancillary. What we really care about for our Python package is this directory right here, this conductor directory. Uh, and what else it needs to be in there? The manage.py. Is that true? Well, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Minimally, it needs to be this directory. So, but there's some problems with this. Let's take a look. Um, you can see this config directory, and we're going to need to talk into some Django specifics. Django, when you are thinking about 
What does a Django app look like? Well, a Django app is really a Django project in their, their terminology. The, a Django app is actually like a major component or subsystem underneath the project. So project is the top level, app is the, the levels below. And everything in my conductor directory are apps. So I have a, an accounts app. I have a planner app, um, a trackers app, and so on and so on. So you can view this conductor directory as my collection of apps. There are some other files that are needed that are used at the project level. And the way I split these out, I started following some of the advice from the book Two Scoops of Django, which I can strongly recommend. Um, it's, uh, it's got some good ideas for if you want to learn Django and want to learn how to make um, structure your apps in really solid ways, there's a lot of good advice in there. Um, but one of the things that they talk about is dealing with settings. And I moved my settings, and, and the settings are Python files, I should, should say. I moved my settings out of the conductor directory and into its own directory. And you can see that here. I've got this config directory, which is all the settings um, stuff. And let's actually go in here for a second. And let's go into the settings directory and see what this looks like. So we have base. And these are the settings that Django looks for when it starts up. So you have a, a Python web server web application server, and you give it the WSGI web server gateway interface entry point that points to a Django application. And that starts all the Django stuff. And when Django starts up, based on a, an environment variable, it looks for the settings to load. So you can have settings that are specific to your development environment, like your local machine. So if you don't want to be really making Stripe charges or something like that, you can you can skip that stuff by using test keys. Um, so it has to load all these settings files. So we need to have and we need to have settings somewhere. Um, but there's there's a problem with the way I did this, and it's in this config directory, and it's these two files of urls.py and whiskey.py. So we'll break them down one at a time. I'll start with WSGI. WSGI is the entry point for the application. So if you're using um, like the micro WSGI application server or the G Unicorn application server, what you have to tell it, and we can find an example. Um, yeah, here's an example. You have to tell G Unicorn where is the entry point? Where's the main function that runs to start the whole thing? And right now, it's in this config module, this WSGI module, and it's called application. And you can see that at the bottom. It's a module level, module scoped, what am I trying to say? Module level scoped variable. There it is. <laughs> um, and that enough is is enough information that G Unicorn can load that in and start things up. But you can see along the way that Django expects to have this Django settings module environment variable defined. And if it doesn't have this defined at all, it doesn't know where to look for settings. So that's the whiskey file. The other file is the URLs file. The URLs file is the top level file that describes every path in your app. So to give you an example, like I have a, a route. So if you go to collegeconductor.com right now and you don't put in any other URLs, you hit the index view, the, the main view. There's a sign up page, there's a contact page, so collegeconductor.com slash sign up. The URLs file defines all of that stuff. So these really, if you think about it, these two things, this WSGI file and this URLs file, they're really app concerns. Um, so they, in my opinion, don't really belong in this config directory. And I think what happened, if I really reflect on it, is there's a, a, a start project command. If you're, if you're working with manage.py, let's get out of here. 
and run manage.py. So you can see this, there's a, there's a couple of like built-in commands here. There's start project and start app. And start project is like, a, remember again, Django, start pro, your project is the top level thing, your apps are the things below it. Start project is the scaffolding to get you going. And it puts the whiskey.py file in there for you. It puts the urls.py file in there for you. And it puts a, a, an introductory set of settings in there for you. And that was it. And I, I used that when I started Conductor. And I never bothered to split apart the settings from these like project level files. So what I want to do is um, switch uh, or move that file, the, the excuse me, the whiskey file and the URLs file into the conductor area so that when we package it all up, those two files will be there. So we're going to have to move it and fiddle with some settings along the way. So let's, let's go, let's start. Um, okay. So the first thing to do, where am I? In the conductor directory, um, is to move the config. Let's start with the whiskey file. I think that'll be easier. Well, they might be equally easy. I don't actually know. We're going to move it to the conductor area. OK. Um, so that's just a straight up move, especially if we tell get what we're doing it so it looks it looks at that and sees it's a pure rename and now we need to search for um, whiskey so we need to find the areas where we need to update this so like for example this proc file this is how I run stuff locally right now if I try to run this and we'll we'll try it in just a second it should fail because it's looking for a whiskey module that is in config. Well, it might not really fail because it might have a cache file, but it should fail on a clean clone. Here's the, the important setting that we need to change in the actual settings area because the settings also need to know where this stuff is. So we want to change that in here. The playbooks, um, looking through here, oh, there's one. That would have caught me. I would have deployed that and totally broken the site. It's a good thing, you know, this is why we do this. This is all just settings that go into the nginx config, so that's that's cool. And those are cool. So really, it looks like the things we need to change are the proc file and the setting, the base settings file, and this playbook file. All right. So let's let's see what happens if we try and run the server now. Okay, good. It said I can't find the whiskey file. There's no module named whiskey. That's exactly what we expect. So we can change this. Let's, the first change was to change the base. No, 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 no. Change the proc file. So we're going to change it from config. And it, it's just a pure move to another directory called conductor. So this is going to be on the Python path. So it's going to find the conductor module, which is where we've moved it. Um, it's right in the top level now. We can see here it is, whiskey. Okay. So let's try running Honcho again, see if it fails or if it's still. Okay. This time it worked, or it appeared to work. Let's test that out because there is that whiskey attribute there that I don't know why it's there. Maybe it'll fail here. No. Okay. I have no idea. What that's all about. So let's see what we can figure it out. So there's whiskey application. I don't know what that's for. I wanna I want to know. Because I don't know. Oh, it's for the run server. Okay. So I guess we don't strictly need it, but it's good to keep these consistent. So we've got conductor. And 
what was the other place that needed it? It was the it was a playbook file um, template. Okay. Conductor. Here it is. Okay. So what, let me explain what this one is. When I am actually running locally, there's a, there's, so, there, so there were a couple of places, right? There was a proc file. A proc file is a way that you can run a Heroku style um, application setup. And I use this tool called Honcho, which for every everything in the proc file, this web worker front end piece, Honcho will start its own process and run that. So locally I'm running to Unicorn because it's really a simple setup. Um, in my production setup, I'm actually running MicroWhiskey. And MicroWhiskey, its configuration is handled here in this file, this um, conductor.conf.j2 file. This is actually managed by Supervisor, yet another tool. <laughs> you can see these, comp these tools get pretty complicated, um, especially if you're running your own infrastructure like I, like I am. So uh, that's actually kind of a takeaway that if, if I had to do this all again, if I wanted to go super fast and get something out there and not have to worry about a bunch of these complications like, well, did I make sure I got this all in the right spots? Um, what I should have, could have done is use a platform as a service like Heroku and Heroku would make this so easy. Uh, very simple kind of deployment process where you just say, I have a Django app, and it might even detect that you have a Django app because it knows that you have a managed PY file, and it just works. Um, so if you're looking for speed, I'd highly recommend Heroku. Uh, it's a little bit um, more costly in the short, short term, um, but if your time is valuable, <laughs> which mine wasn't for this side project, then then you can probably get a lot of benefit out of it. Okay, so we've got conductor whiskey fixed. And it was just the three places and moving the file. So I'm gonna add those three places to the git stage. We can see all of these things are ready to be committed now. What else can we do? Or what else do we need to do, I should say. So the other thing that we need to do is move the URLs file. And where there's going to be a lot more instances of URLs, I think. Well, there's not that many more, surprising. So there's the file itself that we need to move. Those are Django imports. Here's the one that is critical. We have to update the base settings file so it knows where to look for them. And then all the rest of these are Django imports. So we're in good shape. This, might, this one might be even easier than the other one. Um, so let's move config URLs to conductor. And then let's go back to our base file and, um, oh, come on, where are you? There it is, root URL conf. We'll change it to conductor. And just to check that it's still working, let's fire up the local web server again. Because if we got it this wrong, then this is definitely one that we would notice. It would just say, I don't know where the configuration file is. You can also even like see it fail. That might be, it's always, well, I, I, I should say, it's, it's fun for me, I'm kind of nerdy like that, to see these sort of failures in action, to know that the software is working like it's supposed to. So I just refreshed and it worked. So let's undo the change for a second and save it, which is gonna cause everything to restart. Ah, cool, there it is, there's the module not found error so it automatically yeah great 
So we've got the satisfaction of knowing that this is the right change. Cool. And it was, oops. I'm going to call that a rename too, I think. So the short version is we renamed the URLs file, we renamed the WSGI file, we've got the places that we had to update. Nice. And if you have any questions about this stuff or want to deep dive into a topic, let me know. I'm happy to take little tangents. I'm kind of just going on with what my plan was, but in, in absence of questions. Um, so let's commit this stuff. We'll say move whiskey pi and URLs pi and it's four um three seventy four. And I don't think any of the my pi stuff will change good. Okay, now we get to the other bits of making an app, which was over here. So we need to add a setup.py. I, I saw, where was I? I was on Twitter and the guy from Lincoln Loop, Peter, yeah. He presented something very so Lincoln Loop is like a Django consultancy. Pretty cool shop. Um and he presented something at I think it was DjangoCon. I wanna check out his speaker stuff for a minute. Cause I think there was inf interesting information in there about setup. So his basic premise, since I'm scrolling through these, is um, you don't necessarily need Docker. Docker is a lot of code. Uh, it brings in a lot of extra stuff. And is there a way that we can do deployments without it? Um, and his argument is yes. And I agree with him for a lot of apps. There, are, I'm not going to say there aren't places where Docker is appropriate. Um, I can. I've used, used a bunch of those things um, or, or have worked in places that do it. But for an app of this size, um, it's not necessarily appropriate. So, okay. So he's just showing the basic setup.py. Okay, this is the part that I wanted to remember. He added a... a um, this interesting line right here, Django core management, execute from command line, and he called it manage.py. That was a cute, a clever little trick because he shows it somewhere. Come on. I don't remember where he shows it, but he shows you a way to like use manage.py from your package as a uh, script. That's what that's what that line was doing. So, console scripts is a um, the entry point system for setup tools, or excuse me, setup tools. Setup tools is the like the most common packaging system for Python packages. And when you use a console script, uh, what it does is it installs um, a little wrapper into your a bin directory that's on your path. From, from whatever virtual environment has this installed. So it kind of sets up an alias here that says make manage.py use the core manage.py command. I don't know that I'm going to do this tonight because I don't know that I'm going to get a full manage.py in the setup. I don't, I don't know that that's super important for what we're doing, but we'll, we'll try it out. So Let's start with the setup.py, shall we? 
Um, when I come up to the top. Oh, did I want to do? Hmm, hold on. There was another change that I thought about last night that I wanted to maybe get at. So check this out. Now that we've taken out the um, that we've taken out the whiskey and the URLs file, look what's in here. We have an empty init file and a cache directory file and a settings directory. So we essentially have like a totally unnecessary level of stuff. And what does config mean versus settings? So one thing that I thought about doing was why don't we just collapse config and just have the settings directory be at the top level? Why not? Right? Like there's no other purpose. So let's do that before we get into the packaging because that was the other piece that I wanted to um, have to kind of close this off. And um, where is this going to get us? So let's do a search for uh, config settings. Let's see where it is. So essentially any place that we have this config settings, we're going to replace it with just settings. That's my goal out of this. There's a few more places this time to do this. But I think it's still gonna work. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, Joe. Um, they're sort of synonyms, a config, fig, configuration and a setting. They're, that, that, I mean, that's kind of getting to the heart of like, this is totally an unnecessary level of naming. <laughs> and it was maybe a lack of creativity on my part of what could I have called this? Like maybe I could have called this, um, as I mentioned, like Django project and then things under it are apps. So maybe what this would have been better named as is project when it had the whiskey file and the, the URLs file in it. But since those things aren't in it anymore, um, it's purely just a doubly named thing. Um, I do distinguish between settings and secrets. So secrets are things that you do not want to have committed to your repository um, because they're secrets. <laughs> and if, you know, like my, my repository conductor you can it's public you can go up on github go to my account mb layman slash conductor on github and you can view all this stuff um so i have to keep things like stripe keys and all this stuff in encrypted files that live in the repository but they're encrypted and only if you have my private key um, can you see them so there's a there's a useful distinction but most of the time um i, I don't see any real distinction between settings and config man and config stuff so this should be a pretty quick change. We'll have to, we can, I can get this search results from within Vim too, so we can go through these fairly quickly. So step one, let's take, let's move the config settings directory to here. That's the I wanted to do. Yeah. Okay, and now it's going to say everything is renamed. Oh, it's not. Um, I do not want to add that secret file. Um, so let's go into the git ignore. I probably have a rule for the secrets that, oh, where are you? Ah. So here it is. Config is not going to be the right. I'm, I'm ignoring anything with an underscore. So I guess, I guess I need to talk about the way I configured secrets. So Ansible keeps all your secret information in an encrypted file. And when you do, do your deployment, you have an encryption key on your machine um, or private key, and it unlocks your secrets so that Ansible that can, then can use them. 
and you can then take these secrets and you could put them in environment variables you can put them in whatever but what I do in my deployment and I can even show you is I create a template that anything that needs to be coming from a secrets area is defined here so like my Stripe API key, my Stripe Publish OO key, these are things that I don't want to be publicly available, um, or my secret key, aptly named, access tokens, all this stuff. Um, these things are not, they come from this secrets thing, which is only defined in this vault encrypted file. Um, and then I make that my production settings, which we can see here, um nope that's not correct i make my base settings import the 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 things that i wrote out in ansible so that's how i'm getting secrets into the django app but i i need to be careful that i don't i can't open this file right now because it's actually got my keys and I, since i'm recording this i'd have to go rotate all my keys but you can just trust that it's got like configuration variables in there that are just gobbledygook. Um, I wonder why. Ah, because it's in doing. Okay. The way that this production file works is that it imports the base configuration, which then gets the secrets. And then anything that I need to override here, like saying you're going to use the actual S3 storage or you're going to use the mailgun backend versus the dummy backend. That's when those things get over, go overwritten. So my production server has uses this production settings file. Okay, kind of been a little bit roundabout, but um, that gets the idea across. So we now have the git ignore, and now it's properly ignoring that underscore secrets file, which is exactly what we want. But we still have. Um, we still have settings that we need to find. So we want to search for, nope, not conductor, config um, settings. Oh, buoy. What's going on? Try again. Well, what's going on? No, that's not cool. Why is the Vim not seeing that? Come on, Vim. Oh, maybe it's because I got rid of that kind of, I don't know. That's, that's weird. It should, there it goes. Okay, don't know what happened there, but we can go through these and correct them. And it's going to be pretty much just delete the stuff. So not super exciting. Being kind of quiet as I'm focusing on the task. Okay, I think I think that did it. Now, the next step is to see if it still works, because <laughs> I could have really broken stuff. But I don't I don't know why that would have broken this stuff. The is a pretty cut and dry delete the config dot in front of everything kind of collapse the hierarchy and it gives me nice so there's I, I don't I also chose a really bad name for this as well because look at my well it's it's gone now but the previously it was config and conductor 
And I like to tab complete stuff. And I would type out co and then want to tab complete into my conductor directory. And I get the, the beep from, oh, it's still there. Okay, config is still there. We're going to get rid of that too. Um, I get the beep from the system being like, eh, we don't know which one you're talking about. So that was a poor name. I really should have chosen something like project, but whatever. There, see, there it is. I, I like to type out con and then it gives me choices. And I don't want choices. I just want it to expand to the thing I want. So we can remove everything in config. And let's add all this stuff. So we've renamed all of our stuff to settings. We've modified playbooks. We've not modified the files. Oh, some of these things are moving the URLs file. Let's make sure, let's start a poncho, check it locally to make sure it still works. So here's 8080. Oh crap. That's not good. Ah, yeah. Ah. Okay, there's there's some modifications required here. So we've moved everything up a directory. Let's check out um the base file. The base file did some pathing stuff of See this? So because it assumed that things were in config, settings, and then base, it does dir name twice. Now that we're one level less deep, we can do, should be able to get rid of this dir name. Let's think about what that's doing. So we're saying the base directory, and that's that that's referring to what directory is base.py in, is taking the file, the file attribute of this file, getting the absolute path of it, and taking the directory name of that. That's what base dir is, which should be conductor settings. And then to get to the root directory now, we just have to go up one level rather than two. I think that's right. Let's find out. This is why you test. <laughs> cool. Okay, that was a pretty easy change. So what do we say for this one? Um, well, what all is in here? The ignore. Yeah, it's, this was purely about moving the settings. It wasn't the Celery file, the URLs file, we already moved it. We just happened to touch that file. It wasn't the rename. Okay. So we'll say um, collapse config to settings for not very good at remembering issue numbers 374 okay now now I think we can actually get to the setup.py file so we what do we need we need to go up here Here's all of our files. We want to set up that py, and from setup tools, we want to import setup, and we want to import. Well, we want to import find packages. We want to import setup. So, <clears throat> if you've never used setup before, it's it's literally a Python function, and the Python function does a lot of stuff um, but you it's kind of like a Python function where all of the arguments that you pass to it happen to be like configuration parameters this weird mix between code 
and um, yeah, code and configuration file. I don't know what a better, what a better way to say it. And we had uh, Peter's example here. And we'll use that as our starting basis. But you can look at this. The min minimally, what you need in setup, you can put a ton of stuff in setup and a good proper Python package. Like I, I, I did a decent job with this, so we'll pick on one of my packages. Is um, all of this information that you put in setup of py file helps to populate the stuff that shows up on the sidebar in PyPI. Uh, including like the these are called trove classifiers that show up here and who's maintaining it and tags and your license and blah 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 um but you don't need most of this stuff to make an actual package and since this is a package that i have no plan to put on pypi because it just doesn't make sense to put it on there um we can get away with cutting out well essentially what what Peter showed in his, his presentation. You need to have a name, you need to have a version, and you need to list the packages. Even this entry points thing is not required. So we could get away with doing just this much of these three things, and I think that's enough. And technically, uh, you can probably also get away with just the name and version, if I remember correctly. So maybe let's try the very minimal thing to see what will happen. So let's do name, and the name of this is going to be conductor. And version, and for now, I'm just going to say 1.0. Um, that's, that's all I want to put there. Oh man, it's so short that black is even all condensing it down to one line. <clears throat> um, when I make this package properly, <clears throat> I think I'm going to want um, I'm going to want some kind of incrementing number from uh, circles EI because I want to make I want to remember excuse me I'm getting a little hoarse <clears throat> I want this to build as part of the continuous integration pipeline and I don't want to have to fiddle with um, manual versioning. I don't want to have to come in here and every time I commit, say, okay, I need a new version. That's not what I want to do. So I think what I want to have happen is that where I'm currently setting this 1.0, um, it will come from one of CircleCI's. Yeah, I might, I might use the GitHub version tag, so the Git SHA. Like a, there's a way, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, Git not being useful because it's documentation isn't great. There's a way to get the Git SHA like really quickly, like a short short hash, I might use that. Um, the other thing I thought was maybe I want like a monotonically increasing number and I might use the circle CI build number because why not it's a it's a number that will you know who cares if it's conductor 320 or however many builds i have i don't even know um so i just need a a number that i can pull from the environment variables that will come populate this for the purpose of making a package tonight though i think it's totally fine to leave it as 1.0 and and i'll probably do the the other bit when i get down to adding this to CI, which maybe I'll do next week. I don't know. So let's try this. Let's see what happens if we just do this. So the way you build packages, if you've never done it before, is you run the setup.py file as a command. And it takes, it actually gives you like a bunch of options now. You can, it becomes, because the function is smart and knows that it's, a command line tool basically you get all this extra stuff um, and what we really wanted to see was help commands which shows all of the commands that come along with this what I'm interested in is this one right here so 
you can make packages in a lot of different ways. There are source distribution packages, which will just include, um, what will they include? The source files, <laughs> nothing else. I don't think it will even include C files, uh, the Py, Py C files, um, or PyCache, wherever they, whatever they do for Python 3 these days. Um, but when you say you want a binary, uh, this bdist is for binary distribution. Oh gosh, there's so much history here. Um, these aren't packages. <laughs> uh, uh, the terminology in Python is the thing that you are generating is technically called a distribution. Horrible legacy name where every other language now calls them packages and we even call it the Python package index. Like everybody thinks of these as packages, but in if you're an actual package maintainer and package creator, they're technically distributions. So, you know, if you look up here where it says distribution, it's a it's it's replace do a substitution in your mind for package. So what we want to do is make a wheel package. And a wheel package is um, it's pretty cool, uh, pretty powerful because what it can do is like say you had uh, C extensions in your stuff, uh, like actual C code that needs to be compiled to make your stuff really fast, and you wanted to ship your code to someone who doesn't have a compiler on their machine. If you're using a source distribution of just the source code, those people are stuck because they can't compile your stuff. So a wheel file is, is essentially Python's latest binary binary format. There were others, in the, there's like egg in the past, there was an RPM. Like I said, there's a long legacy of what's happened here. Um, but wheel is the latest and greatest one. So when we build a wheel, it's going to include, it's gonna like compile everything it can, which should include the py, PYC files, um, and it puts it all into an archive file that uh, that then you should be able to ship around, and it will call it WHL as the extension, I believe. So let's try it out. <clears throat> now remember, I have not put anything in here except giving this a name and a version number. I haven't told it where any packages are, so it's going to be pretty dumb. And we'll actually we'll make two different things. We'll make the source distribution. And we'll make the BDIST wheel. You can pass both of those in at the same time. Okay, so if you look in here, uh, there is now a dist directory. Um, let's so and if we do a tar, what is it? TZF. That's the way to look at stuff. So we can see. The, the tarball, the tar.gz file, is the source distribution, which I'm not going to be going making from here on out. But you can see kind of the structure that it's putting in here. It's putting this egg info thing in it. Don't, don't worry. Don't think too hard about these things. It's not super necessary. And it's putting in a set file. It's putting in basically enough though, so that when you want to make an installable version, you can. That's what's in that one. The wheels are a little bit harder to inspect. I think, in my opinion, because the unzip command doesn't recognize this extension. So I always have to copy them, which is annoying. So we're unzipping it. It's a wheel file is a zip archive. So now if we look at this directory, well, it didn't put anything yet. There's <laughs> if we had unzipped this and we the package actually had something in it, it would have had other stuff. But it, what it did this time was give us this dist info thing. So that's, those are, you're gonna get a dist info and you're gonna get whatever packages like, and now when I'm talking about packages, now I'm talking about Python packages as the things that have a dot i init file or a, a dunder init file in them. That's why the distribution name exists because one was, uh, you couldn't, package was already used as part of the, the naming internal to the language. So when they started talking about the group of files that get shipped up somewhere, they needed to pick a different name, so they picked distribution. So package has a dual meaning in Python. Okay, 
So let's change this. So we aren't using find packages yet. Let's do that now. Let's come to here and we'll say packages, find packages. And so setup tools, why is it complaining? Oh, my pie. One second. There we go. Setup tools gives you this find package function, which does like a, a walk over your source code directory and looks for packages. So now if we do, I'm not gonna do the, the source distribution this time. We'll just do Python setup.py, oops, wrong directory. Python setup.py bdist wheel. Okay, let's look at all the stuff it found. So it's doing a lot of stuff. It found extra things that I'm not sure I would even want to include in there. Like, I don't really, I probably want it to ignore settings. So we're gonna have to figure out a way to prune that out because I, I want to ship. Settings are things that are gonna need to be separate from. The actual thing I want I want like this artifact to be something that as long as you plug in a settings file it should work um, but if you get in here you can start to see that each of my Django applications which includes a bunch of migrations and all this other stuff test files everything was included in here and now if we go into the dist area and we unzip um, this. Sure. Now we have not only this dist info directory, but we also have, this is why I don't want to include the, the settings in this wheel, because I don't want it to be a top level thing. That's not what I'm interested in. I think that's going to mess things up actually and but more importantly we have this conductor directory so if we have like a virtual environment um though if you let's go to this current virtual environment so i'm in a the conductor virtual environment that's where i just navigated to and site packages is where extra stuff gets installed so everything you install from pypi gets put in here so when we build our wheel and we run pip install on the wheel it will get put into site packages and because site packages is on the python path when you start up the interpreter it's going to see your package that's how all of this works uh, but i don't want it to see settings i want to be able to specify my own settings and not have to monkey with the path so this is something i definitely don't want to include <clears throat> so we need the documentation to figure out how to prune that out and there's probably a couple ways to do it let's let's do some searching setup tools find packages looks like there's an exclude that we can give it Cool. That's probably what I want. It looks like exclude takes a, that looks like a tuple. Um, although it probably could also be a list, I would imagine. Anything that's iterable. Let's come down here and we can go back to where we came from, go up, and let's, re let's clean all this stuff out. Because the, the tool chain will just regenerate the directory if it's gone. And I want to be able to confirm that we did this properly. So we're going to come in here and we're now going to say exclude, and we'll do 
settings. Wow, really? Black is still, it's still short enough to fit on one line. I, I like black. Black is the formatting tool. Um, but sometimes it puts a little bit too much on one line for my taste. Like this, these kind of keyword arguments, like this is starting to get pretty nasty looking. And I guess there's an argument that says I could make that into a, a local variable. That's true. Um, but eventually there will be more stuff in here that will make this wrap to multiple lines. So it's all good. So let's make a wheel again. Ah, oh, you little jerks. It's right there again. Unzip. Yep. Shoot. Okay. So what's going on? Exclude is a sequence of package names to exclude. Oh, hmm. So maybe we want to do settings.star might be the thing that we want. So go back up, get rid of that again. Why are you including that? Hmm. Exclude settings. What are other ways that we could trim this out? There, it's probably not the only way. There's also something called a, um, a manifest.in file that you can use, and we'll probably need to use it to add in uh, data files like the templates. So notably absent. So this included all the Python files, which is great, but it would fail miserably as a Django app right now because all of these views, like uh, this this file here, the file here, these things refer to templates that it expects to exist, and we have not include included the templates directory, <clears throat> which lives in conductor. It lives right here, so we need to specifically tell the packaging to include that stuff. Because if we package this up and install it somewhere right now, it would just do, or it would it fail right away. It would look for the template and say, I don't know where this is. <clears throat> okay. So this is bothersome. Either the documentation, well, I doubt the documentation is lying. This is a pretty reliable package must be doing something incorrectly. Did I spell it correctly? Exclude. Gave it a tuple. <clears throat> and I said settings. That all looks right to me. Hmm. See if we can find the manifest. Because I'm going to, I've done this with other approaches. Like you can, there's, um, it's called the manifest include file, but it, it has a, an area that you can prune as well. So it might be something that we could say, you know, find all the packages and then prune this directory so that we don't include it. Um, but I'm trying to find, no, oh, that's Flask documentation, which is cool, but I don't need that right now. Adding 
non code files. Okay. I know for a fact that this is well documented somewhere. I just don't remember where. Maybe it's in the print. Prune directory. Okay, so let's try this. Let's um delete all the stuff in there. Keep it at just fine packages. And now we will we'll make a manifest include. Oops, um, manifest include. We'll say prune settings and see what happens this time. Ah, oh, little jerks. All right. Well, what happens if we do a source dist? Creating all those directories. Ah, you can see there's some warnings about things that we left out. So we do we should come back in here and fix some of those up later. Um, okay. What happens if I now comment this out? Yeah, okay. So if we made a source distribution, it would actually prune that stuff. But it's not doing that for a wheel. So maybe there's some other setting that I'm missing. Hmm. Check the time. We've been going for a while. And I'm kind of running out of steam, I think. So we haven't done static files, but this will be... I think what I want to do is we'll probably stop here. Um, so I don't, you guys can have to watch me, like read a ton of documentation to figure out what's going on. I can report back in next week on how to actually trim out um, a package directory. Um, what I was getting wrong on the exclude, I'm sure there's something I'm getting wrong, but I just don't know what it is and I don't have the mental capacity to, to get it anymore. Um, so let's, let's, you know, let's quit while we're at, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate you all watching tonight, asking questions. Uh, thanks for the feedback. Um, I will take this material and we'll post it to YouTube. So if you want to refer back to some of the stuff that I did, uh, it will be on my channel. I have a playlist that includes all the building SAS episodes. Um, if you found this useful and, uh, want to follow along in the future, I stream typically at, on Wednesday nights at 9 PM, um, Eastern time. And, uh, I will let people know on Twitter when I'm planning to stream. So you can also follow me there. I'm MB Layman, just like my, my GitHub account over here. Um, I do appreciate feedback. If you thought this was crap or if you thought this was great, um, I'd love to, to hear from you and know what, what I can make better. Um, I'm trying to think if, if there's anything else to cover. Uh, follow me on Twitch if you, that's another good way to keep up with me as well. So. I think with that, I'll, I'll leave it there and we'll come back next week. We will uh, revisit this. We will look at more packaging. We'll get this done. We'll probably, hopefully move on to platter and, and get, get some more fun deployment stuff going. So thank you um, for joining tonight. And uh, well, what else is there to say? I, I believe that's it. So take care. Good night.